is another Mystery Teachings Research Notes video and in this video we are going to focus more on Vitruvius and on the measurements of nature that Vitruvius reflected in his architecture. Now this architecture was also applied to the human body by Leonardo da Vinci and Leonardo da Vinci has basically shown in the diagram of what is known as the Vitruvian Man. The divine intelligence or the creator basically fragmented onto foundation and it's almost like the creator is represented in 96 fragments of divinity across four races the white, the red, the black, and the yellow. And this reflection of the creator, of the macro man, is then from which all other cre creation is reflected, is projected. And so this is what Vitruvian man and woman are basically showing us. They're showing us the representation of God on foundation, shown as the macro in Vitruvian man, and behind God in the macro on foundation, we have the influence of the female that is required for God to manifest onto foundation also symbolized there with the creator, with God symbolized on foundation. And then we also see it as the actual first begotten son, which is the first mental emanation of the father. And that is the tribe of the north, the tribe of Dan, which is the first mental emanation, which is the first Messiah, Jesus. And then from Jesus emanates the first female Messiah. And then from then on we have the other three male Messiahs and then the other three female Messiahs also emanate from each male Messiah. This is how the creation at the first emanation of Divine consciousness in man is first manifest on the physical plane. From that time on, it is the female that is required to bring God down to the physical plane. But the first emanation, it is the mental reflection in the first begotten Son of the Father that is first represented here because they are the first manifestation which all else emanates from. And this is why we see such significance placed on the eagle symbolism and the sword symbolism and Jesus and why it's easy for them to make us forget about all the other races that are also represented from the creator. They are also represented in the macrocosm of the divine creator manifest and fragmented onto foundation across four races in 96 divine ones and then all else is a carbon copy from that 96 and so we have now been able to access more information using the work of Vitruvius so I have decided to look more into the work of Vitruvius and discovered that he wrote um, 10 books on architecture. So what I'll do is I'll first of all just give some background into Marcus Vitruvius Pollio and then from there I'm going to read book three of the 10 um, books of architecture that was written by Vitruvius. And this will give us more of an insight in how we can use this information to decode the temples that have been left because all of this information can be applied 
to other ancient structures in some way. And so by understanding this architecture and understanding the temples and the symbolism that is speaking to us within these temples, we will be able to access more information and more confirmation of what we are basically uncovering now. Because all of these columns can be decoded in different ways, and so I will be bringing more information in regards to that. But this is in-depth decoding of information. Okay, this isn't just counting down the side. These are all grouped in Pacific areas. He also uh, was interested in symmetry. It was all about mirroring, you know. I mean, so we have to look at this in another um, perspective, not just the one where we're counting numbers and we're wondering what they may actually connect to. So I will do those in future videos, but for now, I just want to focus on Vitruvius, the man, who was Vitruvius, and read book three of the ten books on architecture by Vitruvius. Marcus Vitruvius Pollio was born circa 80 to 70 BC and died after circa 15 BC. Commonly known as Vitruvius, was a Roman author, architect and engineer during the first century BC, perhaps best known for his multi-volume work entitled De Architectura. Vitruvius is the author of De Architectura, known today as the Ten Books on Architecture, a treatise written in Latin and Ancient Greek on architecture dedicated to the Emperor Augustus. In the preface of Book 1, Vitruvius dedicates his writings, so to give personal knowledge of the quality of buildings to the Emperor. This work is the only surviving major book on architecture from classical antiquity, and according to biographer Petri Link Conan, this text influenced deeply from the early Renaissance onwards, artists, thinkers and architects, among them Leon Battista Alberti, 1404-72, Leonardo da Vinci, 1452-1519, and Michelangelo, 1475-1564. Vitruvius is famous for asserting in his book De Architectura that a structure must exhibit the three qualities of firmitus, utilitus, and venustus. That is, it must be solid, useful, and beautiful. These are sometimes termed the Vitruvian virtues or the Vitruvian triad. According to Vitruvius, architecture is an imitation of nature. This led Vitruvius in defining his Vitruvian man, as drawn later by Leonardo da Vinci, the human body within the circle and the square to be a part of the fundamental geometric pattern of cosmic order. Vitruvius is sometimes loosely referred to as the first architect. However, he himself cites older but less complete works. It seems he was more a creative intellect relaying the knowledge of ancient architectural practice that understood the relationship of man and nature in its universal structure. However, though he may not have been the first architect, he was relaying the architecture of first man. The etymology for the word architect derives from Greek words meaning master and builder, and we can see he was very much showing us the work and ratio of the master builder. Okay, so now that we've learnt something about Vitruvius, I am going to read book three of the ten books on architecture by Vitruvius. So it starts with introduction and then number one. Apollo at Delphi, through the oracular utterance of his priestess, pronounced Socrates, the wisest of men. Of him it is related that he said with sagacity and great learning that the human breast should have been furnished with open windows 
so that men might not keep their feelings concealed, but have them open to view. Oh, that nature, following his idea, had constructed them thus unfolded and obvious to the view. For if it had been so, not merely the virtues and vices of the mind would be easily visible, but also its knowledge of branches of study, displayed to the contemplation of the eyes, would not need testing by untrustworthy powers of judgment, but a singular and lasting influence would thus be lent to the learned and wise. However, since they are not so constructed, but are as nature willed them to be, it is impossible for men, while natural abilities are concealed in the breast, to form a judgment on the quality of the knowledge of the arts which is thus deeply hidden. And if artists themselves testify to their own skill, they can never, unless they are wealthy or famous from the age of their studios, or unless they are also possessed of public favour and of eloquence, have an influence commensurate with their devotion to their pursuits, so that people may believe them to have the knowledge which they profess to have. Number two. In particular, we can learn from this the case of the sculptors and painters of antiquity, those among them who were marked by high station or favourably recommended have come down to posterity with a name that will last forever. For instance, Myron, Polycletus, Phidias, Lysippus, and others who have attained to fame by their art, for they acquired it by the execution of works for great states, or for kings, or for citizens of rank. But those who being men of no less enthusiasm, natural ability and dexterity than those famous artists and who executed no less perfectly finished works for citizens of low station are unremembered, not because they lacked diligence or dexterity in their art, but because fortune failed them. For instance, Teleos of Athens, Chion of Corinth, Myger of Phocian, Pharax of Ephesus, Bodius of Byzantine, and many others. Then there were painters like Aristomenes of Thassos, Polycles of Andron, and Ephesus, Theo of Magnesia, and others who were not deficient in diligence or enthusiasm for their art or in dexterity, but whose narrow means or ill luck or the high position of their rivals in the struggle for honour, stood in the way of their attaining distinction. 3. Of course we need not be surprised if artistic excellence goes unrecognised on account of being unknown. But there should be the greatest indignation when as often good judges are flattered by the charm of social entertainments into a approbation which is a mere pretence. Now, if, as Socrates wished, our feelings, opinions, and knowledge gained by study had been manifest and clear to see, popularity and adulation would have no influence. But men who had reached the height of knowledge by means of correct and definite courses of study would be given commissions without any effort on their part. However, since such things are not plain and apparent to the view, as we think they should have been, and since I observe that the uneducated rather than the educated are in higher favour, thinking it beneath me to engage with the uneducated in the struggle for honour, I prefer to show the excellence of our department of knowledge by the publication of this treatise. Number four. In my first book, Emperor, I describe to you the art with its points of excellence the different kinds of training 
with which the architect ought to be equipped, adding the reasons why he ought to be skilful in them, and I divided up the subject of architecture as a whole amongst its departments, duly defining the limits of each. Next, as was preeminent and necessary, I explained on scientific principles the method of selecting healthy sites for fortified towns, pointed out by geometrical figures with the different winds and the quarters from which they blow, and showed the proper way to lie out the lines of streets and rows of houses within the walls. Here I fixed the end of my first book, in the second, on building materials. I treated their various advantages in structures, and the natural properties of which they are composed. In this third book, I shall speak of the temples of the immortal gods, describing and explaining them in proper manner. Chapter 1 on symmetry in temples and in the human body. Number 1. The design of a temple depends on symmetry, the principles of which be most carefully observed by the architect. They are due to proportion. In Greek, proportion is a correspondence among the measures of the members of an entire work and of the whole to a certain part selected as standard. From this result the principles of symmetry. Without symmetry and proportion there can be no principles in the design of any temple, that is, if there is no precise relation between its members and in the case of those of a well-shaped man. 2. For the human body is so designed by nature that the face from the chin to the top of the forehead and the lowest roots of the hair is a tenth part of the whole height. The open hand from the wrist to the tip of the middle finger is just the same. The head from the chin to the crown is an eighth. And with the neck and shoulder from the top of the breast to the lowest roots of the hair is a sixth. From the middle of the breast to the summit of the crown is a fourth. If we take the height of the face itself, the distance from the bottom of the chin to the underside of the nostrils is one third of it. The nose from under side of the nostrils to a line between the eyebrows is the same. From there to the lowest roots of the hair is also a third, comprising the forehead. The length of the foot is one sixth the height of the body, of the forearm one fourth and the breadth of the breast is also one fourth. The other members too have their own symmetrical proportions and it was by employing them that the famous painters and sculptors of antiquity attained to great and endless renown. 3. Similarly, in the members of a temple there ought to be the greatest harmony in the symmetrical relations of the different parts to the general magnitude of the whole. Then again, in the human body the central point is naturally the navel. For if a man be placed flat on his back with his hands and feet extended and a pair of compasses centred at his navel, the fingers and toes of his two hands and feet will touch the circumference of a circle described therefrom. And just as the human body yields a circular outline, so too a square figure may be found from it. For if we measure the distance from the soles of the feet to the top of the head and then apply that measure to the outstretched arms, the breadth will be found to the same as the height as in the case of plane surfaces which are perfectly square. 4. Therefore, since nature has designed the human body so that its members are duly proportioned to the frame as a whole, it appears that the ancients had good reason for their rule that in perfect buildings the different members must be in exact symmetrical relations to the whole general scheme. Hence, while transmitting to us the proper arrangements for buildings of all kinds, they were particularly careful to do so in the case of temples of the gods, buildings in which merits and faults usually last forever. 5. Further, it was from the members of the body that they derived the fundamental ideas of the measures which are obviously necessary in all works as the finger, 
palm, foot and cubit. These they apportioned so as to form the perfect number, in Greek called perfect. And as the perfect number, the ancients fixed upon ten, for it is from the number of the fingers of the hand that the palm is found, and the foot from the palm. Again, while ten is naturally perfect as being made up of by the fingers of the two palms, Plato also held that this number was perfect because ten is composed of the individual units, called by the Greeks a word for unit. But as soon as eleven or twelve is reached, the numbers being excessive cannot be perfect until they come to ten for the second time, for the components parts of that number are the individual units. Number six. Now number six has got quite a few words written in Greek, so I have actually translated them. So I will tell you the translation of these Greek words. Number six. The mathematicians, however, maintaining a different view, have said that the perfect number is six, because this number is composed of integral parts which are suited numerically to their method of reckoning. Thus, one is one-sixth, two is one-third, three is one-half, four is two-thirds, or Greek word for platoon, as they call it. Five is five-sixths, called a Greek word for a pentamorous, and six is the perfect number, as the number goes on growing larger. The addition of a unit above six is the Greek word for epic, eight, formed by the addition of a third part of six, is the integer and a third, called the Greek word for epitretus. The additional of one half makes nine, and the integer and half termed in Greek a imeolius, the additional of two thirds, making the number ten, is the integer and two thirds, which they call in Greek a epimorus. In the number eleven, where five are added, we have the five sixth, called in Greek a epipemto. Finally, 12 being composed of the two simple integers is called in Greek a double. 7. And further, as the foot is one sixth of a man's height, the height of the body is expressed in number of feet being limited to six, they held that this was the perfect number and observed that the cubit consisted of six palms or 24 fingers. This principle seems to have been followed by the states of Greece. As the cubit consisted of six palms, they made the drachma, which they used as their unit, consist in the same way of six bronze coins, like our asses, which they call obols, and to correspond to the fingers, divided the drachma into twenty-four quarter obols, which some call dichalka and others call trichalka. 8. But our countrymen at first fixed upon the ancient number and made ten bronze pieces go to the denarius, and this is the origin of the name which is applied to the denarius to this day, and the fourth part of it consisting of two asses and half of a third, they called sesters. But later, observing that six and ten were both of them perfect numbers, they combined the two, and thus made the most perfect number 16. They found their authority for this in the foot, for if we take two palms from the cubit, there remains the foot of the four palms. But the palm contains four fingers, hence the foot contains 16 fingers, and the denarius the same number of the bronze asses. 9. Therefore, if it is agreed that number was found out from the human fingers and that there is a symmetrical correspondence between the members separately and the entire form of the body in accordance with a certain part selected as standard. We can have nothing but respect for those who, 
in constructing temples of the immortal gods have so arranged the members of the works that both the separate parts and the whole design may harmonize in their proportions and symmetry. So I will finish there, which is book three and the end of chapter one. And I will begin chapter two in the next video. So I'll leave it there for now. And as always, peace out.